It's great to have you here. Welcome, Lee Thank Alexander. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Dahlia, for the wonderful introduction. And thanks to you all for coming and waiting so patiently uh, while we solved our technical issues. Uh, my name is Lee Alexander. Uh, I do write about digital society and culture, um, and I do narrative design for video games. Um, basically, I don't like to say I work in tech so much as I work on the things that tech enables us to do and the people that we become as a result. So I just want to start with a question for you to consider. Have you ever wished, even if just for an illogical moment, that the internet would just fall in the sea and disappear and stop? Um, you know, obviously we're at you know a festival like this one, so we like technology, I assume, but you know, do you sometimes just ever feverishly look about you and go, oh, this, this is a little farther than I wanted to go, or this is a little much? Um, so these days we're facing a lot in the digital society uh, climate. Um, for one thing, there are invisible algorithms that promote inequality. Um, did you know that Google's map of the world will draw its borders differently? depending on who's looking and where in the world you are. Um, you know, search results or advertisements for executive level jobs are more likely to be served to men than to women. Um, Facebook blocks Bitcoin advertisements because it thinks that's a scam, but white nationalist pages are fine. Um, you know, and, and sometimes it even blocks natural hair tutorials for black women on the grounds that it's racially charged uh, material. Um, we're living in an era where the truth is really malleable and where we have a presumption that the technology that we use is neutral, is reliable, is infallible, but uh, in fact it's being developed, you know, it, it replicates the biases of the people um, who made it. Um, and, and we're surrounded by unchecked misinformation under the guise of opinion uh, to the point where it influences elections and nobody cares. We still venerate technology as this neutral authority that should be permitted to march forward and forward. Um, and that's even before I get into privacy issues, mob behavior, harassment, viral advertising landscape. Um, it's a lot. And sometimes I feel that this is not necessarily the world that we were promised. And even worse is the fact that there are people out there who say things like, well, let's just lo why don't you just log off or just put your phone down? Like, that, like it's something modern people are enabled to opt out of. You know, we hear the advice about going to digital detox. Um, and from now on, these articles and these ideas are about as useful as how to detox from water. Um, is it okay? Yes. Detoxing from online is about as valid a principle as detoxing from water. Um, major parts of our working lives, our social lives, our shopping, um, all of that self-expression is taking place in digital space and that grows ever more true with time. Um, kids born today will never know what it's like not to have you know, digital video or YouTube. There's content networks on YouTube that are literally designed for babies to navigate. Um, and now the day that you let your kid create their first social media profile is, gonna, is now like the day they learn to ride their bike where you set them off into this unavoidable world and they might get hurt but you have to let them do it. Um, so have you ever gone to those parties where everyone has to give their phones to the host or you know, it's a cafe where you have to put your phone in a bowl so you can talk to each other? Um, I think that these people are in denial um, digitally now is how we talk to each other. Uh, we have to check our phone because we're now much more available to our jobs and our families than we've ever been. Um, there are social consequences for being disconnected. And sometimes it's just, you know, we're bombarded with more information than we may have ever been intended to process. Uh, our attention is fragmented across multiple zones. And like sometimes just pretending that you have something to do in your phone buys you a few seconds of privacy and relief, self-ownership. You know, you, I'm sure everyone has pretended to be busy in their phone so that they will be left alone. Um, you know, and have you ever dealt with someone who keeps trying to talk to you even though you're trying to show them that you're busy? I, in my view, the type of people who are in denial and want you to uh, disconnect from this infrastructure in order to focus on them um, are the ones who are, are incorrect or impolite even. 
So yeah, as I say, this wasn't how I hoped um, this would turn out. I used to be kind of an internet evangelist as a teen. Um, nowadays, it's kind of bad news, I think, to be an evangelist of anything because, of course, it's only a matter of time before that thing reveals its hidden evil. Um, <laughs> a few days, a few years ago, I wrote a pretty short ebook called Breathing Machine. Um, it's about growing up on the internet in the 90s and having my adolescence coincide with the flourishing of bulletin boards and early confessional websites, um, the general wild west of weirdos and shock content uh, that comprised the early days of that online experience. Um, the book is not very good, um, and I don't make any royalties from it, so I don't care if you buy it, but it's on Amazon if you're interested. Um, it was a love letter to the internet. That's how much I loved it. Um, back then, we had this idea that the internet was going to be this cool cyberspace that you could go to. Um, it was called the information superhighway. We used words that described space and place and roadmaps um, and navigation to talk about the internet. Uh, Apple's browser is still called Safari, I think, um, after that legacy of transit and exploration that we associated with the early web, um, you know, worldwide web, um, and we use metaphors about spiders and crawlers to highlight um, how these places were interconnected. Um, we used iconographies of maps and globes, and when you, on, when you went online and you opened up your browser, it was like you were going on a journey into virtual space, and you never knew where you would end up. Um, if you went to a website back then, uh, they would have under construction graphics as if you were literally traversing a road that was not complete. Um, and if you had a website on similar topics, they would voluntarily connect into rings so that you could, in a sense, do a loop walk among these affiliated sites and topics. You would be invited to sign something called a guest book, which was the webmaster's own log of who around the world had come to that website. Like, you know, you wanted to know each person who had come to your website um, and what they thought of it. And you know, humans have been writing I was here on, on their discoveries and, and, and their adventures since ancient times. It's part of who we are. Um, and of course, we would also try to leave that register of ourselves in spaces where the space is not literal. Uh, so one of the first times that the web felt like a place for me was when I was 13, and I found a Sailor Moon website um, called Sailor Moon Sleepover. And whoever maintained it had written some really simple and descriptive text um, about how you, as a visitor of this site, were invited to like a fun sleepover with the characters from this anime, like in a pure way for children. Um, you know, you were invited to imagine that these characters were your friends and that you, through the magic of the internet, could go to the place where they were hanging out. And then you sign the guest book and you write down what fun you had. Um, and there wasn't even a lot of material on that website, but for me, it was really enough to cultivate a sense of place. And can you even, can you remember ever feeling that way about the internet? And can you imagine it now? Can you imagine rushing home just so excited to see if you had email and hoping that there would be a lot? Like, that was a completely different time. Um, this sense of the possible and the rare and the special um, that we were going to transcend the actual limitations of being human was part of the early draw of cyberspace as a concept. Um, tech people read a lot of science fiction. And here, finally, they believed was the fruition of all the books they read. Um, in the places that I used to hang out online as a kid, it was second nature to write in chat rooms as if you were a different person or, to, or as if you were playing a different character. Uh, you could write an online journal for someone other than yourself. Um, and just about a decade ago, maybe a little more than that, people were pretty sure that this would continue to develop, that we would have a virtual world, um, or perhaps a few different worlds that we'd develop in parallel to our own. Um, and this belief took the concept of the information superhighway and added a third dimension to it, uh, the idea being that if the web was a world um, and sites were literally sites, places, um, then let's make them look like places, businesses, um, s business centers, you know, parks, schools, virtual conferences, and, and then let's have second selves in these places too. Uh, you, you could have a customizable avatar that represents you in the virtual world um, and the virtual avatar shops at virtual stores and buys virtual clothes and invests in virtual real estate. And this was actually like a legitimately big business idea over, you know, a little over a decade ago with an economy behind it. 
Um, but for some reason, by the time we reached like 2012 or so, the cyberpunk dream of life in virtual reality or the metaverse as imagined by venture capitalists um, had not quite materialized in the expected manner. Those economies are now pretty niche, uh, apparently fueled by, um, you know, fetish items like, uh, you know, avatar, special avatar skins or sex beds. You know, not that there's anything wrong with that. You know, there's no judgment for, for what people do in their personal life. But in a world that has no rules, where people can fly, they still want to have sex in beds, you know? <laughs> and this is, these are all Second Life dream homes. I think they're all Second Life. Some of them might be some similar virtual worlds. Do we really all have the same dream? You know, why would a virtual body, which never gets tired, need all these chairs that you see on the screen? Um, as Nick Yee says in his book, The Proteus Paradox, uh, which I'm paraphrasing, when given a world of unlimited possibility, people mostly just start to prefer to emulate the constraints, the inhibitions, and importantly, the biases and the prejudices of the real world. Um, so, yeah. and. Moreover, it's not really efficient to go and work in a virtual, to decorate your avatar and go to work in your virtual conference room. We have the Office Slack channel. We have the Campfire account. Isn't that just easier? It's a, you know, we wanted one-click interfaces. We wanted to reduce the distance and the filigree between ourselves and the internet. Um, you know, everything else is self-expression. And yeah, most people just wanted the internet to be a place to get things done. Okay, so the internet is not a world anymore. It's not a place you can go. But I also said that we're a bit stuck because we can't put it down or leave either. Um, there's no such thing as logging off. Um, we all depend to some extent, you know, at least folks in our part of the world and in these lines of work, all depend to some extent on digital infrastructure. And everything that we do leaves a slime trail of personal data behind us as deep as a trench. You know, you can no longer even be anonymous online if you wanted to for perfectly harmless reasons. Someone is going to find out who you are. Um, you no longer have a lot of control whatsoever over your personal information, um, and this makes you vulnerable not only to corporations and advertisers, but to other people. Uh, you can be fired for things that you post on your personal Facebook. Um, we live in a world now where anyone who sticks their head up over the line to stand up for what they believe in can be targeted. Uh, I used to write articles about video games um, until I kind of lost interest in that after being targeted. Um, you know, your personal info can be leaked. You can be hacked, or a mob that doesn't like what you have to say um, can mount a campaign to get you fired from your job, even using stuff you posted on the internet from 2004 or something that you thought you deleted. You know, we don't have the control over that footprint anymore. Um, it's almost like Orwellian, except instead of the big brother, we have big data. Uh, so now, how do we exist? Um, and moreover, how do we resist in a land that has been colonized, in this sense, um, by corporations, misinformation, dysfunctional machinery? Um, I'm interested now, um, a lot of my work concerns, how do we discover um, and nurture and negotiate a sense of self in the liminal spaces that we have left? Um, you can't be someone else, and you really have no choice but to negotiate your identity, at least partially now, through the lens of social media and digital culture. And even if you decide to opt out, like, oh, I'm, I'm not on Facebook or Twitter, you know, that is a self-defining choice. So, you know, what can we do? Because I think that a lot of creative technologists um, are really, people like us are really meaningfully struggling with how to be present um, right now. And the person who tells you to put the phone down and switch off is not any more useful to this topic than, you know, the person who still sees a future in digital beds. So I'm going to talk about some things that I think are kind of cool on the internet, some things that I've seen you know, younger people do. Um, so this is kind of interesting. This is an Instagram eyebrow. Uh, so if you note the precision of her eyebrow, the boldness, uh, the way the color fades, it's very precise. Um, this is a beauty trend that began on the internet as entire groups of people who are online that are into beauty and makeup, you know, they get to collectively participate in, in defining and refining these ideas. Um, the interesting thing is a lot of professional stylists actually hate this kind of eyebrow um, because what looks good in a selfie looks kind of weird in real life. You know, in a picture, it's nice. It's made for Instagram. Uh, it's a good, bold frame for the eyes. But, you know, in real life, it looks less good. It's a bit strange. Um, 
However, that's not the point. This is a way of thinking about makeup that is designed for the selfie first uh, and the in-person experience later. So if you're a young person today, thousands of people could see your selfie and only like a few dozen people are going to see you in a day. So I mean, obviously, this is the priority, right? So here's some other super hot beauty trends of just the last few years that like, you know, I found these a few months ago and I've hung on to them and they're already out of date. Um, <laughs> and you aren't likely to see these offline. Um, the pace of social media trends is so quick. So um, over here we have um, rainbow highlighter. Uh, it sort of makes you look like someone has shine, shown a prism on your face. Uh, the other highlighting technique is like looks like a heat map or, or a, a, yeah, like thermal map, and it's called thermal highlighter. Uh, the lips are called geode lips because they look like stones or crystals. It looks amazing, but you're not going to wear this to work. Like even if you went clubbing with the geode lips, imagine after you have one drink. Like, <laughs> I mean, I, but again, that's not the point. It's not for your physical body. It is a version of yourself that is designed for virtual space and to show and to share and to participate into that in that discourse. So let's go further. Now there are Snapchat filters. Every camera app now has this. Um, not only can you be a dog or a minion or do face swaps with your friend, um, they animate. Uh, it's to have fun with. Uh, and when you send it to your friend, it's not because you want to show them something genuine. You know, there's a lot of young people uh, think think pieces about how young people are so obsessed with documenting their every meal or whatever. But when you look at these types of interactions and performances, you can see that those people are simply wrong. Um, you know, it is, it is about interaction and performance and self-definition, and it's not about being obsessed with, you know, being narcissistic or self-absorbed. It's rather trying to change the terms of the conversation around who you are. Um, this is me put through a beautification filter. <laughs> um, it kind of refines your face into uh, alien Western beauty standards. Um, you get a version of yourself that is just a little more beautiful, assuming you're light-skinned. Um, a lot of these apps do not, unfortunately, work on people of color. Um, and, and everybody knows I don't actually look like that, but that's not really the point for me. So. A lot of these very exaggerated, bold styles of makeup, um, the explosion of contouring tutorials on the internet. So the contouring style of makeup comes from drag culture. Um, you know, I think a lot of these techniques were pioneered by drag queens and burlesque performers. And then when you think about it a step further, the history of drag, um, the sayings and the mannerisms were in turn appropriated from women of color. So, you know, this type of stylized presentation can be viewed perhaps as a response to oppression and exclusion um, by making a performance of the concept of gender. Um, the point of it is, yeah, people engaged in performance or exaggeration in order to take back a little bit of control over their identity and over their self-expression in a world that is hostile to them. So what if so-called selfie culture is a similar type of performance? Like, are today's young people trying to take a little bit of ownership over their image in a time when they feel abandoned by the economy, let down by the education system, afraid of the return of conservative ideals? You know, is this a coping? mechanism, finding a way to manage our own image again and to give new meaning to it. Uh, you know, so we didn't make the 3D virtual character versions of ourselves, but we're designing our avatars for the internet just the same. Um, yeah, we've created a terrible world for young people today. Um, what must it be like to grow up in a world where, you know, you've had a footprint on the internet um, before you were even old enough to consent to one? You know, all those baby pictures that my friends post, you know, I love them, but that means their children are going to have a virtual trail from, you know, before they even knew, you know, before they could even say anything about their image. Um, and when today's folks, young people, do try to do a little something for themselves, then comes a million think pieces about how they're narcissistic and obsessed with themselves. And when you look at how they vote, you know, they, uh, young people today, in at least, you know, where I come from, really seem to be more educated and compassionate about the world than ever. Um, I'm in my 30s. But, you know, I think the kids are all right. Um, we can't go back to how things were before, um, this age of overwhelm and hyperconnectivity. Uh, we could sooner turn back the tide. So for me, it's helpful to consider participating in digital society conscientiously um, instead of automatically. You don't want to be the person who goes around, you know, spouting virtual reality startup jargon, but you don't want to be the person who's in a panic about how intimacy has disappeared and all these things that the internet has supposedly destroyed. Um, yeah, don't try to be 
be that person who makes everyone put their phones in a bowl at the party, unless everyone is really into that. <laughs> um, no judgment. But, you know, you want to imagine and create, oh, excuse me, you want to imagine and create experiences that modern users can participate in the way that they're comfortable, rather than forcing them to pretend that we live in a different time. So what would it be like to, sorry, oops. Yeah, what would it be like to simply accept this climate of overwhelm and upheaval, of fragmentation of our attention and our self-identification, -ident figure out how to make content for that attention economy, and as consumers, figure out what we need to be as happy as possible in this world? Uh, you know, what if some of the things you need the most are online, like your crazy Pinterest or your Reddit group or your Facebook Messenger window to your oldest friend that lives in another country? Um, for other people, that means they need to delete their Twitter. I, I just often feel like I should delete my Twitter. Um, you know, I also belong to a seltzer fan group on Facebook. It's a, a group for fans of flavored club soda, pretty much. Um, <laughs> and it keeps me going. It's like a pure and wholesome thing. Um, you know, as much as I have preached radical acceptance of the grotesque digital media environment, you know, I still need to have plugins in my Chrome that force me not to go on social media when I need to be working, uh, or so that I don't like post impulsive things when I'm feeling anxious. Um, but there are some weird and cool coping mechanisms that I came to talk about. Um, so throughout history, you know, pagan beliefs or covens of witches or, or the practice of magic and folklore often emerges among populations who have been oppressed or displaced in some way or whose lands were being taken over by, for example, Christian patriarchs. Um, and folklore and magic became ways of resisting and replace, re resisting the established social order and sort of trying to return to nature or to roll back norms in order to expose ideas and practices that were at risk of being forgotten. I think there will always be magic on the internet as well as folklore. Um, I listen to like binaural ASMR chants on YouTube or sometimes I watch self-hypnosis videos. There's some like great stuff still out there. Um, there's tarot communities on Tumblr, um, you know, spell casting communities on Instagram. Uh, it feels to me like this is on the rise. It could just be the circles that I move in. Um, I'm really interested in emoji spell casting, um, <laughs> which is like, you know, it seems kind of funny, like why would putting a bunch of symbols between crystal balls and then reblogging it actually do anything, but you don't necessarily have to believe in magic. Like, you don't have to believe that magic is real to believe that patterns and intention can be meaningful for you and, and can help you feel a sense of control in a world where you might not have any. Um, yeah, like it can offer you a peaceful relationship with things that seem terrifying. And it's not really any different than the writing and the sigil making and the pattern making that we have been doing with other um, input devices all, 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 all the time our species has existed. Um, sometimes I put emoji spells in the text field of my alarm phone to help me wake up feeling, you know, not hungover or something. Um, and again, it's not so much that I believe that it works, but it feels like something offbeat that I'm doing to sort of resist the norms of the, of the technology environment. And it, it helps you keep your freedom if, if you find things like that. I also like to watch something called satisfying videos on YouTube. Has anyone heard of the satisfying videos? Um, it's a broad genre. Usually it involves like objects falling neatly into place or recipes for slime, raindrop cakes that are like gelatinous and smooth. Um, you know, Usually the money shot is they'll then they'll cut it with the knife at the end, and I've watched the video just waiting to see them make all of these gelatins and then cut them. Um, and maybe you've even seen some of these floating around as if they were anxiety cures. Uh, like you can watch someone decorate a cupcake slowly with perfect flowers, and you just get like mesmerized by that. Um, seriously, try this type satisfying video into YouTube and, and thank me later. And they're huge. These things have millions and millions and millions of views. Um, it makes me wonder if we're all sort of attracted to this analysis of form. Like there's a sort of global pastime in watching substances lose their shape and then recombine again. Um, you know, this contradiction between form and formlessness kind of feels to me like the perfect entertainment for the like post-capitalist internet age where we're trying to decide what version of the world is real and, and where structures as we know them are coming loose and melting. Um, I have one final suggestion. <laughs> 
for you for how to use the internet for magic instead of to just look at people you don't like who contact you against your wishes. Um, it can seriously help you time travel in a sense. Um, so this is my favorite thing right now. Go to YouTube, search for TV ads, and then type in a year that you want to visit. Um, I like to go back to the late 80s and early 90s because that's when I was an eight-year-old falling asleep on my grandmother's leather sofa after dinner. Um, and I also like to watch vintage talk shows or those late night ads for compilation CDs, <laughs> you know those? <laughs> because the format alone is surprising. When you look at how the world used to look through the lens of its media, it's a very strange feeling. And, and it's not just for nostalgia. Um, or it is also super amazing that there are people out there picking up old VHS tapes from yard sales just so they can put the ads on YouTube. Like whoever those people are, I depend on them and they're amazing. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's interesting to watch this for me because it clarifies and it crystallizes for me just how rapidly the media landscape has changed in our lifetime. Um, you know, people our age are sort of uniquely lucky in that lots of us can remember the world before as well as after the mainstreaming of the internet, and we were literate at both sides of that chasm. Um, so to do this form of YouTube time travel is soothing, but it's also really thought-provoking. You know, Trust me, every time I tell people about this, like go watch ads on YouTube from the year that you were eight or nine from your country or from, you know, go find that region and the year that is gonna tick that box for you. They don't believe me and then within five minutes of them watching it, they're like, oh my God, I remember this. This is so weird and it's just, it's a way of using social media and internet video networks for something new and weird um, that sort of rebels against the current um, state that they're in. Like, just try, try this. You will have fireworks right in your temporal lobe, I promise. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, it is extremely cool to be here, uh, and I'd love to talk more about these types of things with you uh, if you want to collaborate or just talk. Um, thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Lee. Thank you so much for this uh, uh, really great and entertaining presentation <laughs> on the colonization of the internet and the remaining uh, hidden spots you can find there. Are there any questions or comments from the audience? Yeah. Aiden? Hi, Lee. Thanks. That was really... Um very engaging. Thank I, you. I, I have to go check out so many of those examples now. I know my wife's going to love the satisfying videos oh in particular. God, That's what she says she loves about Tetris is the way everything <laughs> falls into place and I think she's going to be mesmerized. Um, I wanted to ask when you showed the spells, um, each one of them said uh, likes charge and reblogs cast. Um, and it, it, it made me wonder to what extent that practice with the spells, and I think this is uh, uh, more generally true, but it's particularly evident with those spells, that there's something kind of self-serving about it. I mean, you're casting this spell for yourself, but in fact, part of it is trying to attract a certain kind of internet-specific attention where a bunch of people like it for you, and that somehow affirms your cyber self, affirms your power, as uh, a, a subject of the world internet today, which none of that sounds terrible, but I don't know, I look at that rather cynically. I mean, if that's what's going on, can we still regard it as the sort of affirmative, experimental, weird practice, or does it just become uh, yet another version of normativity that is particular to the way the internet works today? I think that's a super interesting question and you know I think the people who do these things like obviously those were spells about how to get your windows working and things like that so I think that the people who are doing it are taking it with a little bit of good humor usually um, however I don't necessarily agree that everything about sharing is subject to the attention economy I think you know for example any kind of magical practice in history is communal and you know the 
you're, what, rather than asking for attention, I think these users are asking others to buy collectively into their intention. So, you know, the like or the reblog or something is the acknowledgement that someone else saw this and also wants this for you. You know what I mean? Um, so that's why it's powerful, because the more people who see, acknowledge, and consider it, um, that, that's the theory, is that the more people who see, acknowledge, and consider something, the more powerful it becomes. And you know, you're right that there is a lot of toxicity to the attention economy, but I think that this kind of intention economy is a more productive way of doing it because you know, it's playful, it's people collaborating, it's not so much look at me, look at me, but like, let's all be on this thing together, which I think is truer to the original spirit um, of what these platforms were supposed to be for. But yeah, no, I don't think the cynicism is necessarily unwarranted, and I think Again, one of the defining traits of young people is they do feel pretty bleak. Like if you look at the memes that people in their 20s make, and if you look at the humor that young people in their 20s do on the internet, like I don't know how convinced they are that anything is real. You know what I mean? So for the, for, for them, this is this is a sort of participatory thing that I, I see as constructive. But you know, you're not. I don't think your perspective is necessarily wrong. I would like to uh, add a question, um, or that's connected to Aiden's question. Um, do you think there's any um, subversive, um, like p subversive political potential in these practices, uh, other than regaining control over a domain where you I, kind I of do, lost it? I do think and I do hope that the potential for political subversion is there. I think that there is at least a renewal, or like, for some people in America are becoming like leftists for the first time. Like America is a young country, you know that we don't really have, you know, not since we were founded do we have any kind of history of workers' revolution. Well, that's not true. Um, that, that's absolutely not true. We do have, we do, I just think that this is a, dis a, a climate of political discovery for this generation for the first time, and that it has sort of um, productively contributed to, to that collaboration. Um, I think also, though, you know, the memification of politics can risk oversimplifying them. You know, when everything becomes a hashtag, you know, does that does that make is it more effective because it reaches more people, or is it less effective because everything becomes reduced to the same types of misinformation? Um, yeah, I do. I, I think that people, that young people, are largely using the internet productively for activism, um, and older people are maybe ruining it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, any more questions or comments from the audience? And if not, this is not too bad, because then actually we can catch up with our schedule. We're run yeah, a bit I, late. I everyone's <laughs> sitting for a really long time. Thank you so much for your patience and attention. Yeah, thank you Lee again for your presentation. <laughs> <laughs>